Hi, I'm Chris Rycroft and welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. In a previous video in this series, we looked at incorporating equality constraints into an optimization problem by introducing additional degrees of freedom called Lagrange multipliers. We could then solve our constrained optimization problem by looking for stationary points of a Lagrangian function that involved these additional Lagrange multipliers. Previously, we only looked at this mathematically, but here we're going to look at solving these systems numerically using the Newton method. We'll see that this leads to a very nice framework referred to as sequential quadratic programming. Let's now consider equality constrained minimization, and we want to minimize f of x for x in Rn subject to g of x equal to zero. And here f is a function from Rn to R, and g is a function from rn to rm. And in a previous video, we saw that we could solve this problem mathematically by introducing a Lagrangian that's a function of x and a m-dimensional vector lambda of Lagrange multipliers. And we defined that L of x and lambda was equal to f of x plus lambda transpose times g of x. And a necessary condition for optimality is that the gradient of L is equal to zero. And we can break this gradient down into two parts. If we look at the gradient of L with respect to x, then we have grad f of x plus the Jacobian of g transpose of x times lambda. And if we look at the gradient of L with respect to lambda, then we get g of x. And so to solve this problem, we would have to have both of these components equal to zero. And we'll now look at solving this problem numerically. And once again, we can note that this is a nonlinear system of equations, and therefore we could solve it using Newton's method. And to use Newton's method, we'll have to derive the Jacobian of the gradient of L. So let's now think of the gradient of L as a n plus m dimensional vector, where the first n components correspond to the x-coordinates, and the last m components correspond to the lambda coordinates. So we need to differentiate the gradient of L with respect to both x and lambda. And for i from 1 to n, we can write down that the ith component of the gradient of L is equal to df by dxi, plus the sum from k who 1 to m of lambda k dgk by dxi. And if we differentiate this with respect to xj for j equal 1 to n, then we obtain that d by dxj of the ith component of the gradient of L is equal to d squared f by dxi dxj, plus the sum from k who 1 to m of lambda k times d squared gk by dxi dxj. Hence, the top left n by n block of the gradient of L is given by the Hessian of f plus the sum from k equal 1 to m of lambda k times the Hessian of gk. And we define this to be b of x and lambda. So now let's look at differentiating the ith component of the gradient of L with respect to lambda j, where j is from 1 to m. So we'll have d by d lambda j of the ith component of the gradient of L, and that will evaluate to dgj by dxi. Hence, we see that the top right n by m block of the Jacobian is given by the Jacobian of g transpose. Now let's look at i from n plus 1 to n plus m. And we know that the ith component of the gradient of L for this range is given by gi of x. And if we differentiate the ith component of the gradient of L for this range of i with respect to xj, then we'll get d by dxj of the ith component of the gradient of L, and that will be equal to dgi by dxj. And that will then give us that the bottom left m by n block of the Jacobian is given by jg at x. Finally, 
we can see that the bottom right m by m block is just zero because the differentiation of the gi of x with respect to lambda j will just evaluate to a zero. We've now derived the complete form of the Jacobian of the gradient of L, and it will have a two by two block structure. And the components will be B of X and lambda, the Jacobian of G transpose X, the Jacobian of G X, and zero. And overall, this will give us a M plus N by M plus N square matrix. And matrices of this form are often referred to as KKT matrices after Karush, Kuhn and Tucker, who did seminal work in nonlinear optimization. Therefore, if we apply Newton's method to solve the gradient of L equals zero, then we'll end up with steps with the following form. We'll have our square matrix for the Jacobian of the gradient of L and we'll then have a step that is broken out into two components, sk of dimension n and delta k of dimension m. And on the right hand side we'll have minus the gradient of L. Once we've found sk and delta k, we can use those to update xk and lambda k respectively. So now let's take a step back and consider a constrained minimization problem with a specific form. So let's write that xk and lambda k are our Newton iterate at step k, and let's introduce a vector s in n dimensions. And let's look at a minimization problem over s where we want to minimize the following expression. A half s transpose b of xk and lambda k s plus s transpose applied to the gradient of f at xk, plus the Jacobian of g transpose at xk times lambda k. And additionally, we have constraints that the Jacobian of g xk times s plus g of xk is equal to zero. And this objective function is quadratic in s, and the constraints are linear in s. And this is because we are treating xk and lambda k as constants here. So we could solve this system by writing a Lagrangian lk of s and delta, and here delta are the Lagrange multipliers that we would need in order to impose the linear constraints. And we could go ahead and solve this by calculating the gradient of LK and setting it to zero. And if we do this calculation, then we'll find that we get the exact same system to solve as in the Newton method at step K. And this provides us with insight because it shows us that each step of the Newton's method we're exactly solving a minimization problem with a quadratic objective function and linear constraints. And an optimization problem of this type is called a quadratic program. And this motivates the name for applying Newton's method to solve the gradient of L equals zero. And we call this sequential quadratic programming or SQP. And SQP is an important method, and there are many issues for us to consider. We could look at solving the linear systems in the Newton method efficiently, and we might want to exploit the two by two block structure. We might want to use quasi-Newton approximations to the Hessian, just as we did for the unconstrained case. We could use truss region or line search approaches to improve the robustness. We could look more carefully at the treatment of both equality and inequality constraints. And we could also look at selecting good starting guesses for our Lagrange multipliers lambda. And if we considered these issues, then we could end up with a efficient and reliable implementation.